welcome to the Succeeding Over All Roadblocks LifeCast, a show about self-discovery and vibrating higher in every area of your life. Each week, I'll have conversations with some of my favorite people who are soaring over life's challenges. They'll share their struggles, but more importantly, the lessons they've learned along the way. I'm your host, Keisha Whitaker, entrepreneur and transformational speaker. Let's get ready to soar. Before we jump into the main content for today, I want to take a moment and give a special shout out to Love Noir 13. Here's what they said in their five star review on Apple Podcasts. Very personal and relatable. Honestly, this is my first time intently listening to a podcast. Your show makes me feel like I'm right in the middle of the conversation. Very engaging and genuine. Wishing you all the success and more. Thank you so much, Love Noir 13, for those kind words. It means a lot. If you'd like to receive a shout out on a future episode, leave a review for the show in Apple Podcasts, anywhere you listen to podcasts, or podchaser.com. You can also record a question or comment, and it may be answered on the show. Now, let's get into the episode. My guest this week is the wonderful Dorian Spears. I love the way she seamlessly blends both her personal and professional lives by building genuine relationships with authenticity, sometimes candor, but always with intention. Dorian is the Chief Partnerships Officer for Momentum Nonprofit Partners in Memphis, Tennessee. She has a heart for service and a wealth of experience in nonprofit, government, and business sectors. After college, she worked for a social services agency on a mayoral task force to curb gun violence. She's also been an entrepreneur and worked as a county economic development official before joining Momentum Nonprofit Partners which coordinates local philanthropic efforts. She's a thought leader and speaks frequently on racial disparities and diversity inclusion issues. Please welcome Dorian Spears to the show. Hey, Dorian. Hey. How are you? I'm doing all right. I'm happy to be here. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm so glad that you're here with me today. And we're going to have a great conversation. I admire you and have admired you from afar and as a friend for quite some time. And I love how you are able to build genuine connections, not just in your personal life, but also your professional life and how you live with intention. I call you my Zen goddess. You always, you always have such a Zen energy and spirit about you. And so I want to dive into what that what that means for you and how you create that energy and space in your life. So let's jump right on in. I know that you do a lot in the community, but it starts with your career as a chief partnerships officer for Momentum Nonprofit Partners here in Memphis, Tennessee. And that means you're working every day to build relationships between government, nonprofit, and the private sector to solve our community's issues. So tell me about how you build those relationships and I guess what your job really entails. If I had to put it in short, it's being a bridge builder. In essence, with where I am with Momentum, I got to work in different bridges that weren't connected. (laughs) They were connected to themselves more or less, but being able to take all of the connections across sectors, you know, being able to build, as you said, like those genuine authentic relationships with people. And I would say the, the way that comes to me is through a lot of listening a lot of observation, a lot of attentiveness, and being mindful that I'm sitting across from a human being. And this is not transactional if I don't want it to be. I've worked on the ground in the trenches. I've done the, between the work of being able to be that conduit and now being in a, I guess what you would call a C-suite role, being able to take all those things I learned from the ground up and like still be a whole human and not forget that there are people we're serving ultimately in the work. So if that, if it's ever a moment where if my ego gets in the way or I'm sitting in a room and people are having, you know, a, a pissing contest, um, <laughs> I know what it is. And my question to them will always be, well, what about the people we serve? If it weren't for them, we wouldn't be here. So I always try to make sure even in this role, 
And I know titles can mean different things to different people. I'm not terribly tied up in them um, because I've met many people of high titles that are not really good people and good souls. So it's really about the person and, you know, the integrity they hold when they do interact and treat people well who may not be able to benefit them. So I always think about it from that lens. And you're in a very tiny package, by the way. You're a very tiny woman sitting at the table (laughs) with all these men and having to really navigate that space. And you do it with such a a quiet strength and presence uh, about yourself. And so talk about that. Is that something you learn or is that something you just it's naturally you and you sit in those environments and you kind of wield your presence, you know, in those spaces. How do you do, how did you, were you able to do that? I would say the marked moment that that happened for me, there was the before I met, now a mentor that worked at the organization that we were doing the Welfare to Work program. She was also a tiny package, small Jewish woman. We're still in contact, senior VP of an organization based out of New York. I think prior to her, those things were in me and I would occasionally hear about them from myself and from other people to share, but didn't truly believe it or internalize it. But it was probably the first three days I went to Seedco, that organization to work with her and serve that I saw her because she was a New Yorker. So we're walking all over downtown in some spots where people would normally get in the car and drive. And I'm like, okay, well, we're clearly going to get exercise and be nice with our weight. <laughs> but I saw her sit across a table from, you know, to be quite honest, like white men that would turn red when she said, you know, in this the first year of this contract, you're going to lose money. And white people don't want to hear they're going to lose money. <laughs> so I saw them turn red and I saw her just do it without being mousy or be demure about it. She just looked across the table and said, this is what it is. There were some things that you said also in that about the nonprofit world. So when you reached the not, when you reached that space um, and I've worked in it too, and it's from the outside looking in, it's a very crowded community. There are a lot of nonprofits in this city yet we still have a lot of issues that the needle hasn't really been moved on. Like we're still teetering around almost 30% poverty rate, those kinds of things. And a lot of those issues are framed inside of systemic racism. So do you think that nonprofits are addressing the community issues like poverty, education, and crime at the right level? Or are they just Let's fix the immediate need, but not dealing with the the actual framing of what is causing it. That's a loaded question, Keisha, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach it the best way I can. I think you have a theory. I'll divide it into thirds. You have a third of people that, you know, get into this particular sector because it's the noble thing and may or may not see the systemic racism. They just know that someone is not of a certain stature or that they haven't lifted themselves to what whatever middle class or our our classes, you know, are deemed here in the U.S. I think you have, you know, there are leaders and staff people that are there to get a check. And then I think there are people like, I would say me and my colleagues that understand there are other issues at play. We know that nonprofits get money from other nonprofits called philanthropy. And philanthropy may or may not see those systemic issues because they're coming from means. There's wealth. There's, I am taking a percentage of however I've gotten my money, whether it was handed down off the backs of us um, historically or other means and businesses that I need to give a particular percentage for this to go well and my taxes to be good. So when I think about it, it's it's the thirds with the people. And then I think, think it's also a three-legged stool. So you have philanthropy again, that have the purse strings for nonprofits to actually get what they need. And you know, I this I think if there's any year that really tests this, to its core is 2020 and the fact that we've already had those issues and statistics that you called out. I mean, close to 50% poverty for Black children, which is the same way it was about 50 years ago. That means there are a lot of kids that are just going to not be, and our ability to, to go upwardly mobile is limited by that. We're up there in the top with that as well. So I think when I, I look at it, there are other issues at play and there are people that do care about it like me, but I also know that I'm not going to let the world drive me crazy and that I have to maintain my sanity about it and understand where I am and operate in that. And then there are, you know, I think probably deeper conversations have started to happen here um, and have yet to grow 
so that particularly the philanthropic side understands this could be changed for the better. I and mean, we don't have to do a Band-Aid approach because we want to want to get into heaven by doing good work. We want to do work that's just and from a space where someone is elevated so that, you know, any child that's in the 50 percentile of being poor is not looking forward to being poor, you know, 50 years from the time they're 12. Um, and that's the part I think that gets me. And then I will tie in the other leg of our business enterprises. What do we tout? What do we celebrate here? We are logistics transportation capital. Why? Because you can get anywhere from this city within three hours to fly cross country. Um, so there's because I've worked in these different areas and have seen these things, if we were to, that's why the bridge building is so important to me. People will get in their own spaces and think, I'm doing a good thing where I am. And in my mind, for my innovation team days, I'm like you could be so much better if you connected to this other person doing this good thing and connected to this other person doing this good thing. And together you can make a life better, not by yourself. And I think, you know, when I think about like white dominant culture and some of the characteristics of that, individuality is prized here. In the, in, as we know as Western culture of the US. Whereas if you go with others, you go far. If you go alone, you, you don't get as far. So I do believe in the importance of understanding we can make this a community thing, even with for-profits, if we really wanted to help you know, get some people out of spaces where they're not worried about poverty or having to resort to particular lifestyles that you know, middle class may deem, you know, well, that's not you're not a good thing or look down upon when if that's your means of survival to make sure your family has food on the table or whatever you need to be, you know, happy in the joy in the small world that you occupy, then people are going to do it. I think that was an excellent answer. Very diplomatic of you. <laughs> and I think it, it really does drive home the point. I've heard you describe yourself as an introvert and as an empath. What does that mean? to be an empath? I'm going to start with introvert and then make the connection because I'm learning some new things about empaths in terms of the, the good, bad, and ugly that I'm, again, just kind of introduced to last week. So I'm trying to get my head around the new stuff. But in terms of, for me, introvert, I was probably called shy quite a bit as a kid. But it was interesting when I, when I jumped over to do the innovation team, one of Bloomberg's um, consultants, I guess, during his elections, um, he called it. When we sat across the table and he called me eagle eye and I looked at him and I was like, you see me because no one else was understanding the value of being quiet in a space and taken in an environment before you open your mouth. There are other layers of reasons why I didn't do that as a black woman being able to talk in a space. The minute you mess up or decide to fly off the handle, they're going to hold you to that more than they hold you to the intellect that you actually you know, have. So the fact that that particular person saw me, again, I internalized it and realized, okay, there are people out here that get me versus not. But I think back to just the shy piece, it was, I was really observant, um, continue to be so. I don't know, it's just something about like looking or people watching and kind of taking in things. Also, I think when I connected to the, the empathic nature, it was, I was taking in energy too. So again, back to work environments or sitting in meetings and just realizing some people are just, you know, going to be downright mean. And I'm just like, what is, what's going on? <laughs> like, the, again, what's not being said? And um, I think one of the bigger moments for me, and I started to reach out to mentors of mine, one particular was an HR person that when I started to get to the end of jobs in my mind, body and soul, like all of me, um, I would say I would physically feel off and they would say something like, yeah, something happened to me physically too, whether it's attention. I've had mentors that have been hospitalized because they took on so much that it manifested physically. And I would say at this particular juncture, as I'm learning about impasse and there are other language around that too, that I am one that can absorb and observe, but I also end up feeling things physically. So because I'm hardheaded and I don't pay attention to the whisper, my body begins to absorb things like a sponge and it becomes a screen. Particularly if the job I had at Edge, I was sitting back to back with a colleague who had lower back pain. And I couldn't bring in Sage because, you know, the sprinklers would go off and I didn't want to bring in crystals because I'm like one of two women <laughs> sitting in this office to protect my energy. But I realized in that moment, okay, every time it's time for me to make a transition, my body's having to turn up 
in a way that I'm just not, I'm not paying attention because I'm too busy trying to compartmentalize things and keep it together. And again, the superwoman trope of holding it all in and never feeling. And I think the more recent jobs I've had that I've learned definitely to listen to that um, because it's other people's energies that are affecting me. And that I think that's the curse of it. And that's something where my mom's like, well, you know, you can just like put up a wall. And I'm just like, I wish. <laughs> but again, thankfully due to COVID, I can work from home. And it's been like the best year in so many ways because I'm not having to deal with like water cooler talk or, you know, feeling that someone may have had a bad weekend, but they're pretending when they say hello in the morning, if they say hello. Um, it's been, I've actually been able to stay much more in tune with myself and actually memories and things I've probably have put away and compartmentalized have begun to surface. So I do morning meditations with an app called Shine, and it is for women of color, founded by two women of color. And that daily meditation, I think I'm at 90, either 91 or 92 days consecutively I've been doing this. And it's anywhere from like a five to 12, 13 minute meditation to set intentions for the day. Um, and today's particularly was about celebrate what you have done and don't think about what's not finished because that's what builds your confidence to have you know, a positive mindset or one of gratitude to do more. And it's things like that that have kind of kept me, it centered me in a way that those previous jobs, I just didn't get into a practice of looking into myself and setting intentions in a really authentic way. This year's definitely allowed me to, to do that. And like, again, with the impact that I, I probably have even stronger spidey senses now because I'm so much with myself that when I do get out of an environment, you know, my body's like, oh, it's time to go. And I leave. I don't wait. I don't push it. I don't say, oh, I'll just stay another hour. No, I'll just leave. So I think it's so important that you honor what you're feeling in your body and in your spirit. And I think there takes a lot of self-awareness. Like people just aren't as self-aware as they need to be. And when I met you, that was something that I didn't have an awareness about about of myself either. I would, would feel uneasy in situations and I would feel that people could see through me like I was transparent. And one day I realized, okay, I'm using my own power on myself. It's inward. Once I started turning it outward and feeling different energies and different, you know, people's spirits around me, now it's hard for me to be out because it's very draining. I probably don't feel it to the extent that you do. Like you are very, very in tune with it. But I know if you see me shut down in a room, somebody's spirit is not right. Like I stopped talking. Sometimes I've gotten physically ill, like my stomach, like I would have to leave the, like, and it's an involuntary thing. I just get up and walk and walk out. Don't even realize I did that. Or I'm trying to hurry up and get out of the room. Like I like, I got to get out of here. Like I feel like the walls are closing in. How do you try to, I guess, put on the front and, and keep, you know, because sometimes you just can't, like if the energy's bad, it's just, I, I, I do not have a good look on my face. I cannot hide it. Um, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. So any advice for how to kind of have a poker face in those situations? That's a great question. I try so many different tactics. And because I was a psychology major in college, I like having social experiments. So there are some people, if we're done with the meeting and I walk up to, at that time in the past, shake their hand. I'm so glad we don't have to shake hands anymore. I'm so excited because that's an energy exchange too, right? So <laughs> there are people where I've just looked at them and just called them out for what I saw them. And I think that comes from my parents. <laughs> and I have a little chuckle at the end or something, but there have been some people that I've worked with and they're just all just at being extra. And I'm, I look at them and say, don't mess this up. <laughs> or I'll say, I see you and I'm gonna keep my eye on you. I think it just depends on, on the person um, again, I think being it, being a woman that's sat in these spaces that are male dominated, because there have been some other examples, particularly in the consulting space where I had to say no to opportunities because I was like, first of all, this doesn't feel right. And for me to be the only woman sitting in this room with these people, again, it's awkward. Like, what are we missing here? So for me, I think it it just depends. Sometimes it gets so amazing that I'll just go treat myself because I made it through. So I could go get a smoothie, go get some ice cream, you know, sit through it. And, you know, I'd make the eye contact. 
I try to stay engaged um, and just really focus on what I need to glean from the moment. And sometimes, you know, depending on how how snazzy the, the bubble in the wall gets, I can set up my little force field and for someone to like try to poke and say things. And I'm like, mm, this is not this is not the person you want to talk to about that <laughs> and just be really clear and candid. So I think it depends on the situation that's allowed me to get through it. But I do know now when I do get out of those situations, I go celebrate the fact that I got through. Quick reminder, this is the penultimate episode leading to next week's special season finale. I'll be joined by friends from my sister circle for a virtual happy hour where we'll chop it up about living the single life, dating, and being childless versus child free. Don't miss the season finale on December 16th. The video will also be available on YouTube and Facebook. Back to the conversation with Dorian. If I don't ask you anything else today is if you take away the job titles, the accolades, the awards, the panels, discussions, and all the things that you do and you, the work who is Dorian Spears Merriweather? Who who are you at the core of everything? That's a great question. I don't know if I've ever gotten that before. I do ask other people, so I got to really think about this one. I would say I am one that contrary to whatever exposure I have to the external world and perceived extrovert, because that does happen because of the way I can connect, is that I truly am one that builds energy from within being alone. I I love to read books. I am a, a sponge for knowledge. I'm a sponge for being challenged in ways, um, the healthy ways. And those typically come from my friendship circles where they're just naturally curious. And particularly my friends from the North that tend to come across as a bit more aggressive, like seems like we're fighting, but it's all love. Um, and just one that actually just enjoys living life without the schedule, without the rigidity. I am one that typically goes with the flow. Um, and I'm learning to integrate that more, I think, on the, the professional side as well. But I, I am one that just really wants to enjoy life. And joy is so has become really important, particularly this year. I've talked about it before, you know, just kind of out in the ether. But I realize how important it is for me that if I have not laughed, that day that we got to laugh, even if we got to find some comedy, <laughs> if someone's going to check somebody, if my brother, because he's good at that, but just for me, finding those things that keep like head, heart, body, and soul well. So I'm someone that definitely appreciates my wholeness as much as I can gather, um, my wellness, um, Something that's been really big for me this year, and I've thought about it. I have a T-shirt that says it, breaking generational curses since conception. I realize that, you know, there's some interesting stories around, like, my families, both sides, my mom and dad, and trauma, that, you know, people are going to teach you what they know, and they're only going to be an extent of the experiences that they've had. And, you know, even if they do want you to be better than they were and go out there and, and launch and be the best person you can be, they're still only teaching you from the space that they know best, particularly experiences and how they deal with, you know, not so pleasant things. And, you know, did you ever, you know, embrace joy in a way to, you know, fully be yourself or where you're encouraged to be yourself? So for me, I'm also one um, which is why it's so important on the professional end. I, I try to remove ego because I'm carrying my family with me and all the people before me when I show up in a space. And the reason that I, I try to mesh them now is because it was terribly exhausting to live a duplicitous life is having one way show up professionally and have another way show up personally. Elders taught me that in community that, you know, I would be honest with them. They'd be honest with me. I'm like, I'm not here to waste your time. They say, we don't want you to. And let's figure out how to make this time work for our, our benefit. So I think, you know, being that it's mostly my aunts and uncles, my, all of my grandparents are gone. And there's so many stories I wish I could have, but they're positive points of their legacy that I want to carry. And there's some not so positive points of legacy that I would rather leave behind. And when I think about that, that to my core is I'm going to be an extension of those people. And I do hope between like my brother, I have a nephew now that he's better than we are 
and can accomplish and still have this sense of what, you know, working for something looks like, what it's like to experience things across the spectrum. As I've thought about, you know, being a kid or having other friends that may have had things passed down to them. And I didn't come from means, you know, what it's like to success for me is when the people I serve are happy. It's not my litmus. Um, it's for the people that ultimately can benefit from me being a conduit. So I think when I take away, like to your point, all of the things that that you've shared, it's I just I want to be a good person. I want to leave the, the the world better than I found it, and definitely make sure in terms of the legacy that by you know part of the branch of a tree that is you know America is has left fighting, um, and we, we've left the world empty. We we didn't we didn't leave full. We left it with all that we had to give. As I listened to that, you said a lot in in one particular part that I that really stuck out with me was when you're talking about breaking generational cur- generational curses and some of those things that you've had to discover and learn about yourself and this show is succeeding over all roadblocks. What is one of those roadblocks that you feel uh, may have been a barrier? to your growth, your personal growth and development, and what was attributed to that, and how did you overcome it? I got a whole bunch I can pull from the sky, but I will say, I'll start with the fact that when I was eight years old, I wanted to go to Harvard, I wanted to pledge and be in a sorority, and I was like, I'm going to go to Boston, because Memphis, the South is just not, I never felt like I was of Memphis, so much that I still get asked, are you from here? (laughs) And that's been my entire life now. I learned to take it with a grain of salt, but I wanted to, that was my aspiration when I was eight. So fast forward to high school, I had taken the ACT when I was 12 through the talent identification program at Duke. And that allows me privilege to have access to Ivy League school. So they'll come to you and they try to recruit you. And lo and behold, Harvard tried their hardest. Harvard, UPenn, I don't think I looked at Yale or Princeton, but Harvard was just like, we want well-rounded and well-lopsided people. And I was like, I'm the lopsided one you want. And they kept sending letters. And somewhere in the back of my mind, because I think I'd seen the way my grandmother kind of dealt with my mom and her siblings in terms of they had opportunities that were afforded to them, but I think she was afraid. So some of them didn't get a chance to go live them fully. One particular example, one of my uncles, the second oldest on my mom's side, played trumpet and bongos. James Brown caught eye, wanted him to tour with him when he was 16. My grandmother said no, so he didn't go. Their youngest brother, huge tennis star, is why I, how I started learning how to play tennis when I was eight or nine years old, had a scholarship to Arkansas State. My grandmother said no. So I'm living in my grandparents' household when all these Harvard letters and, you know, you get all the college recruitments and you have to put them in a garbage bag. So (laughs) Harvard just kept trying. And there was some little recess in the back of my mind that said, what if I go there and become someone that my family doesn't recognize? Mm. And that's what prohibited me in my mind as how I forgot how I guess I was in my teens. But, you know, clearly I had what it took. You know, took the ACT at a pretty young age, scored pretty high on standardized tests when I was, you know, sixth grade. But there was a fear that totally blocked that. And I say all that to say that fear and setting boundaries in terms of their particular places you want to go, that's something I probably had to overcome that was the biggest. My brother and I both, actually, and we have another brother who's since passed on, but because we saw, particularly my mom's side of the family, be so risk averse. We're the total opposite. And we had to grow up in a household of people that were risk averse. And that's a lot of tension when you're a kid that wants to go out and see the world and (laughs) do all the things because you know that the world is big and you know that you have something to glean and lessons to learn from it to be in a space of people that were afraid. And, you know, I think in hindsight, when I've talked to my aunt about this, that, you know, it could be just my grandmother didn't have a particular level of exposure. So there's the fear of the unknown. But as a child, I didn't understand that it's. I'm a child and you're supposed to want me to go out and do, you know, conquer the world. But then I had to take in context, you know, in terms of back to your point about systemic racism and these barriers that were put in place for them. Cause that, my, that side of the family, my grandparents were born in 1920, which my grandfather at the time was born during the pandemic a <laughs> hundred years ago. And then my grandmother was born in 1926. So that was the silent generation. When we think about, 
you know, age demographics. And, you know, they were, again, outspoken, but there was a, still a certain part of the world that they were confined to, more my grandmother than my granddad, I think, because he got to visit D.C. on occasion. But I, when I talk about those barriers, I think it's, you know, not being afraid, which is probably why I'm least afraid to, like, start things from scratch and be creative and fail, because the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to get better. You're giving yourself a chance to fail up. You're giving yourself a chance to improve. You're getting you're giving yourself a chance to internalize that failure isn't permanent. And on top of that, setting boundaries when people try to put particular limitations on you to say, hey, I don't know who you are, but this is who I am. <laughs> and this is what I'm about to do. And if you try to limit that, you're going to fail in that because of my being on this earth desires and sees myself in more than what you see. So those are really huge in terms of even having very frank conversations with my family about it. Um, my dad's a little different, but like even just going out with my mom and understanding in terms of like setting new stages and boundaries and even talking about like, you know, black families going to like college and you make a little more money than your generation before. And the fact that that money is not communal just because I get it. We're not, I'm not paid like that. I'm not wealthy. And I do distinguish being rich from wealthy. Rich is you can afford the car of your dreams. Wealthy is somebody you can pay them to drive it for you. And there's a particular level of, you know, just aspirations and goals. Like I keep to myself, my brother and I talk about it, but we realize sometimes they're big and people will just say all kinds of things. And I'm like, I don't live in your world, so you can't really limit me. <laughs> but yeah, just particular goals I realize I've been setting or in those intentions and the meditations daily or what lead to that, like the gratitude, finding out and remembering what I'm thankful for. If the sun's out that day and I'm struggling a bit, I'm happy that the sun's shining because that's another day for me to do something differently and improve it a little bit better in my life. And if that day doesn't work well, we got another one, thankfully, that if I wake up to see it, that's my opportunity. So I, I definitely have moved more into the car carpe diem, which I used to think about like in a cavalier way, but I'm, I'm learning to internalize that this year for obvious reasons. There's so much loss, so many issues of the, the sy systems that have been exacerbated by disease, by, I think, a second wave of our civil rights movement for the 21st century that people are tired. And if you have the ability and means to, to soar and get out there and get in the skies and touch the moon, do it because you don't know what your life's going to look like. And for me, that's that's been an interesting push and dynamic that I've had to have a conversation with my family about that, you know, it's like, this is this is where I am. And, you know, you support me or you don't. And you can be as conservative or risk averse as you are. You don't have to put that limitation on me. So that definitely has been something I've had. It's been in conversation, but in terms of living that world, I've definitely had to do that more this year than than ever in my 41 years. You know, I've had to struggle with that, too. And setting the boundary of here's my dream, here's my goal. And someone saying, no, you shouldn't do that. Like I wanted to go to Tulum by myself to Mexico for my 40th birthday. And don't do that by yourself. You don't know what could happen. And then I get scared and I freak out and I don't go. Right. So I think you're absolutely right. We can't let other people's fears be projected onto us and what we want for ourselves and I've sat back on the porch too long watching everybody else play. And I'm like, I want to play too. I'm learning how to really step out. And what you just said really blessed me. It was something I actually needed to hear in the moment. And you probably felt that the empathic you that you are. <laughs> but I really think that there's something about having that dream and that seed that's planted in you and you holding on to that for yourself and not letting other people disturb that seed. And I'm growing. And this podcast is definitely an extension of that growth and that seed because it took me three years to do this, two or but three you years. you did it. And I'm yeah. so proud of you. Thank you. And so I'm here and ready to play because you always worry about what people are going to think about you, you know? Some of us worry. I don't. Like I went to Johannesburg. I think I made the decision a year before my 40th. I was like, I'm going to go to Johannesburg. But it was because a mutual friend of ours kept saying, you know, you need to check out Johannesburg. Like, I think it's your vibe. And I've been there twice. <laughs> I went last year for my 40th. I spent well, 11 days and went earlier this year, right before COVID. And it is 
It is a place where I feel it's another place that's like home. I think you can make home anywhere you, you are. It means something to step off of a plane and literally see an airport full of Black people or go to a place or a bar that's owned by Black people and they're like getting their life, even though they're about 26 years, you know, removed from apartheid. There's something in them that fuels me to want to do and be better. And if I hadn't taken that trip, I mean, I went up Table Mountain, which I'm afraid of heights, but I'm like, I'm going to do this anyway because I'm turning 40. <laughs> like, why not? So those trips for me and travel, it, I love it when my world feels and like expands because then my heart is open, my mind is open. I'm having to put on a different set of intelligences to take in an environment. And that's a challenge I appreciate. I'm the person that is comfortable getting lost. I was before GPS. I will be comfortable even with GPS. So there are things where I just have to challenge certain parts of myself that don't, those muscles don't get exercised and travel like does that for me. So yeah, my dad was like, why do you want to go to Africa? I said, because why not? And my dad said, okay. They probably wonder, where do we get this child from? <laughs> <laughs> but I've always been that way too. I always saw the world as this a huge place and I read a lot of books. All I did was read, read, read as a kid. And I always saw myself being somewhere, not in Memphis for sure, definitely saw myself somewhere far away, never to return. And I'm glad I'm back though. I will say I'm glad I'm home. Home is home and family and being here and all the things that have, have transpired since I've been back. I'm glad I was here for it because had I not been, uh, I would have felt guilt about that. Yeah, I, I long for the day that I can step on uh, the continent of Africa, see the motherland, possibly go back to wherever, you know, my roots are traced and go to that door of return. Yeah, so it, it feels good. Like I, it's very, it's still difficult to explain, but yeah, to get off that plane and know you're about to see a whole bunch of people with amazing melanin there's nothing like it and it was so good I had to go back in less twice in less than a year I think I would feel the the ancestors did you have that experience when you went did you feel something of a connection to the earth or the or the ancestors or something like that the first time yes the second time um unfortunately I lost the the oldest uncle who was the one that's just like the life of the party he passed at 71 um, around MLK's celebration of his birthday, but he acted like he was 17. So there was a point where I went to a nonprofit that um, a local nonprofit here introduced me to their executive director. And she's like, do you want to meet someone there? I said, absolutely. So <laughs> he became a, a meeting with their, his co-director. And while he was walking out, walking us out on the grounds of the nonprofit and the land that they have, the, there were butterflies making my, their migration to Mozambique. So for me, butterflies is like this transition in ancestry. So I was like, my uncle's okay that I'm here. But it was just tons of white butterflies, like just flying. I was like, okay, Sonny, I know you're, and I le I literally went, I helped to like plan the funeral with my aunt, um, his sister, and I went to the visitation. And later on that night, I was uh, heading to Johannesburg. So I missed the funeral, but I know he was, he knows me. He knew me well enough to know as soon as I'm the person, if I got a car, he's like, you're about to take a road trip. And he always gave me gas money. So, and I saw the butterflies, I thought of him being happy that I had made that trip and still got to pay my, my, my respects to him before, before I left. Yeah. Ladybugs are that for me. I see a lot mm -hmm. of ladybugs when someone close to me uh, transitions, ladybugs always come and visit me. So yeah. <laughs> well, Miss Dorian, the time has come and I have thoroughly enjoyed catching up with you and hearing your story and just learning what makes you tick even more. So thank you for being on the show and tell us where uh, people can have, where we can find you online if people want to connect with you. Sure. Um, I'm on Instagram at Dorian underscore 901. And on LinkedIn, if you just type in my name in lowercase, Dorian Spears, I'm on LinkedIn. I've deactivated my Facebook account for the last two months and I may do it through the end of the year. But yeah, it's on Instagram. I'm actually posting the intention of the meditations that I do each morning and just things to think about. So absolutely. And again, Keisha, congratulations. This is no small feat. 
And again, I'm so proud of you and just thankful to be considered to have this conversation that's elevated me in a lot of ways as well with you. Thank you for letting me release verbally, you know, who I am on the inside. So I appreciate you deeply and love you greatly. I love you too. And your spirit and your energy is just so, so strong. And I feel like when I'm, when I'm around you, when I'm talking to you, even when I see your post, I feel you in the, in the post. I'm like, Dorian, you're so sweet. Just so, so thoughtful. And um, I just see great things for you. And I wanted people to glean more insight into who you are. I think you, like I said, I think you're a thought leader. I think you're someone who has so much value and so much knowledge and the world needs to know who you are. So thank you for that opportunity. And I am wishing you the best onward and upward as well. Thank you. And thank you all for listening. If you want to connect with us again, everything will be in the description box, how to contact Dorian, how to contact myself and connect with us on social media or shoot us an email. Until then, I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Succeeding Over All Roadblocks Lifecast. Follow the show on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter at Soar Lifecast for more tips and motivation. You can also email questions to SoarLifeCast at gmail.com. Be sure to catch new episodes every week and leave a review of the show. Until then, keep soaring. <laughs>